So this, this uh, session is what is a healthy city uh, for the health of the city. In case you're in the log. I got on a plane one time, so we'll on the long flight to make sure. So I have the pleasure to present our, our first our two presenters, Elena Hibero, uh, who is a professor in public health at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, she's she's a, has a doctorate from Berkeley. She's written a couple recent books. Um, uh, Saúde Meio Ambiente em São Paulo, Na Cidade de São Paulo e Saúde Global. Uh, and, um, and our second speaker is uh, Joe, Joe Amen, who is, uh, who is the Health and Human Rights Division Director for Human Rights Watch. Uh, he's a lecturer here at the Woodrow Wilson School uh, at Princeton University. And, um, and he's, um, he's an epidemiologist. Uh, and then our two, our two uh, discussants you already know, uh, Bruno and Bruno Trinet. <laughs> Bruno and Joan. Um, Father and of Andres, are you here? <laughs> and, and he'll be hosting us for our party tonight. But anyway, uh, so let's get started right away. Uh, I'm very proud to be here this afternoon, and I thank Joan, Lili, Bruno, Marcelo, and all of you, first for the wonderful hospitality for the invitation and for the very inspiring conferences we had those days. Well, uh, being a, uh, okay. my, my speech is a little different because I'm a geographer as a background, okay? <laughs> and I work with environmental health, so it's more, uh, Cartesian, the way I present the, my speech. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, urban space or the city is a mirror of society that lives in that city. So, uh, the discussion on a healthy city uh, obviously passes by the discussion on the construction of. Uh, more unequal society, a less unequal society, a more equal society, okay? Uh, there are other problems involved in the, a healthy city, which is the large demographic growth in all the world, the uh, increased urbanization processes, and the increase in the consumption patterns, which has as consequence the production of wastes and of pollution. And that makes the uh, stage for the study. Uh, one uh, problem regarding that aspect is that local government uh, and the cities, they do not have any power to work in uh, income distribution. Income distribution is more related to federal government. We can see the example now of Obama trying to increase the minimum wage in the United States from $7 an hour to $10, uh, $10 an hour. And the opposition to that saying that this will going to increase unemployment in cities and create urban problems. Uh, so usually the cities receive and uh, as a consequence uh, uh, policies and uh, actions that are done at the federal level or even at the international level, at the global level. Uh, the cities depend on decisions taken by industries, by large corporations, <coughs> or by other levels of government. Uh, on the other hand, uh, cities feel the effects of uh, economic crisis more sharply than in, uh, earlier than uh, the country as a whole. A recent report by World Bank, I was reading last week, said that uh, the mayors felt the 2008 crisis at least two years before national governments started to feel the crisis. And they fell to unemployment and to 
decreasing buying power of people. Uh, so what's in, in discussion is uh, if we make interventions in the urban space, uh, can we improve health in the city? Can we, we decrease the inequities or the inequalities within the city at the local level with only local government interventions in the space? Okay. Uh, I put a book here <laughs> because I found very interesting that that book had a uh, important role in my studies. Not that I, I was here at the time, but I, I read this book recommended by my advisor in Berkeley. And it's a seminar that happened here in Princeton 60 years ago. And it's called Man's Role in Changing the Face <coughs> of the Earth. This seminar uh, was, a, well, was a international symposium was called by an anthropological society. Is Warner Green? Is it? And it's in the foreword. It says the anthropologists should open their eyes for other science and then for other problems to discuss them uh, with other scientists. And the, the, those that organized the conference was Carl Sauer, which was a, a, a geographer with whom I studied in Berkeley. Uh, Marston Bates was a biologist, and Lewis Mumford an urbanist. And this, that book was published in 56. So it's um, almost 20 years before <coughs> Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, which is considered a uh, landmark in the environmental movement. In this book, there are two important articles, and I'm referring to them because I'm going to uh, use them. Uh, first, uh, one of them is The Natural History of Urbanization, written by Lewis Mumford, and shows the, the role of cities in uh, creating uh, environmental uh, problems or environmental impacts in the rest of the country because of consumption <coughs> and use of energy and a lot of things. And the other one is the climate of towns. It's a pioneer role uh, paper in studying uh, climate change within the city. Okay. Well, uh, as uh, João gave me this topic to, to talk about, I got the definition of WHO, what's a healthy city? Like uh, uh, Edgar Mohan would say is a onusiana onusian word, uma palavra da ONU, né? Uma definição da ONU, né? But according to WHO, in 1988, a healthy city is one that's continually creating and improving those physical and social environments and expanding those community resources which enable people to mutually support, support each other in performing all the functions of life and developing to their maximum potential. So it's more a wish or a direction then a, a definition of what a healthy city represents. Well, this was international development initiatives. And uh, what's the, the idea was to place health right in the agendas of decision makers and to promote uh, comprehensive local strategies for health protection and sustainable development. Those are WHO words, OK? And the basic features of a healthy city would be community participation and empowerment, intersectoral partnership, and participant equity. So it's uh, very much a political movement uh, aimed to des design for mayors and secretaries of health in the municipalities. Uh, so uh, a healthy city depended not only on 
current health infrastructure, but uh, based on the commitment of the city and the city environment uh, uh, to forge necessary connections in political, economic, and social arenas. The program started in 1986 and uh, started with cities in developed countries, mainly Canada, United Na uh, States, Australia, and European cities. In uh, developing world, started later in 1994. Uh, the city of Sao Paulo was one that adopted this healthy city concept uh, during the uh, uh, the mayor with Mayor Erundina at that time. And uh, uh, later, the, the program was abandoned. And today, uh, as the the site of WHO said last week, there are uh, a thousand cities in this network of uh, healthy cities around the world. Uh, however, this concept, uh, well, the, what that was the, the aim of the a healthy city program. And there's a word there to provide basic sanitation, hygiene needs for all the city, and to pro uh, healthcare was the last thing. Okay. Um, well, the health sector in the academia was a little far from the discussion. That was very much a discussion with health secretaries within cities and municipalities. Uh, and uh, reading the literature, uh, some authors say that because there was a lack of evidence of, from studies relating environmental conditions and health in an urban scale, not an individual scale, uh, the tradition of doctors of dealing more with individual cause effects studies uh, consequently, there's a, a shortage of studies on healthy cities, on health in the city as a, a whole. More recently, uh, the concept of urban health appeared, and this seems more accepted by the academic, uh, by academy. Uh, and there is uh, an international society for urban health was created and it's uh, uh, related to the New York Academy of Medicine, the, the, the office of the international <coughs> society and there's international uh, uh, review on, on urban health. Uh, well, how do you define urban health? Uh, that uh, is a health that includes the whole of the physical and the social environment of the place in effect people's health. So health is related to population composition, to the characteristics of the physical and of the social environment and to the individual attributes, so three level and there are some studies, uh, multi-level analysis because of this concept and this uh, theoretical framework of urban health. In 2011, Pan American Health Organization established a strategic uh, action plan for urban health. And I got this from the document. Uh, and the document says that unplanned and unsustainable urban growth puts pressure on basic services, turning possible for governments to attend the basic needs of a diverse population with different habits, lifestyles, and dynamics. So a city is more complex than a, a unique thing, homogeneous thing. And that the risks to the population are related to environmental, social, and epidemiological factors besides disasters and violence. That's all in this document. Well, the challenges put in the document are that population growth increase in inequalities, inequities inside the cities uh, that nowadays have large poverty belts in neighborhoods with a lot of poverty, few job opportunities, 
poor housing, lack of security, and basic sanitation, in spite of a reduction in urban poverty the number of poor is still very high in the cities. So the, the, the action plan says this, uh, to assume health promotion, to adapt service to this dynamic and diverse urban population, to increase popul uh, policies and interventions based on evidence to improve human and financial capacities, and to defend equity in health and well-being of urban population as a target to be achieved in the wider responsibility of local and national governments, academy, private sector, NGOs, and civil society. So <coughs> has this political, uh, well, one of the challenges of urban health is methods. Uh, the studies need to measure these uh, inequities, inequalities within the city and different uh, gradients in uh, comparing cities, that's uh, between cities and within cities, intra-urban areas also. Another challenge, Doctor says, to, differ in, uh, to separate inequalities, which are differences that <coughs> occur because of individual characteristics or neighborhood characteristics or a lot of other char characteristics and inequities that they say yeah, unjust and solvable differences. And you have to focus on the inequities. There are those that are unjust and solvable. Uh, uh, then another problem is that uh, that's collected in different and homo homogeneous ways. Uh, a dependence on partnership and interdisciplinary knowledge, and uh, a need to incorporate social and environmental determinants. That's those are the main challenges. Just uh, now, I'm going just to show some example in Brazil. Well, you must be aware of that: the, the increase in urbanization the percentage of households with water and sewage systems. This document uh, represents Brazil. Uh, water treatment uh, and sewage collection here. You can see in red less than 10%, in pink 10 and 20% of the households that have sewage collection. So there's a big uh, inequity in Brazil regarding these aspects. If you go to the state of Sao Paulo, the situation uh, improves a lot. And this uh, graph was made by a colleague, it was Vanderlei Paganini, that shows, uh, well, uh, water in blue, water. Uh, treated water in households, 99% of households in the state of Sao Paulo have treated water, and sewage collection, 82%. And the, the curve in red shows the decline in infant mortality. So it was, it's what Marsha was uh, uh, talking yesterday about this problem. So this is the problem that's well identified in Brazil among uh, urban health uh, people and environmental health people. You have to focus this in, uh, in the state of Sao Paulo, at least this has been a prior priority. But there are other problems that are coming about with that. Mm -hmm. with, uh, one of them is climate change and um, climate variability, very unstable mm -hmm. climate with uh, heat waves and cold waves, very strong and high precipitation. And there are a lot of studies trying to uh, see the health Im impacts of this climate change within the city. So this I got from this World Bank paper, said there is a relationship regarding uh, greenhouse gases emission and uh, production of waste also. Uh, one can see in the left corner, like Southeast Asia, that people produce little weight and little 
uh, greenhouse gases, and the, in the opposite side, uh, Europe and North America. You can see the continent. United States is on the top there, produce a lot of waste and <coughs> greenhouse gases. Uh, but uh, greenhouse g gases can be produced by cattle, by forest deforestation. Thing. Within the city, what produces more greenhouse gases is transport, fuel combustion, waste production. Uh, and I'm going to focus more on these things as a, a cause for climate change and not in the <coughs> other things. If you get Sao Paulo, uh, that amount of precipitation uh, rainfall in the last 43 years, one can see that's a tendency to increase rainfall. That's 72. I have a little time. And that's uh, temperature. Uh, that's temperature anomalies uh, from 70s to 2012. So one can see in the first years until 99, 92, the anomalies were more uh, cold uh, uh, in, in the cold spectrum, less temperature. And from then on, all the anomalies re are related to higher temperature than average. So there's a, a problem there besides the uh, heat island effect, which is something more related to the city. Regarding waste production, I just put some data here that I have, but I can see the city of Sao Paulo between one and one and a half kilos per day per person, which is almost arriving to what the United States produce, which is two kilos per day. But uh, in the average, the country is between uh, 0.7 and 1 kilo per capita per day. But I'm not going to enter too much on this, I, and I'm going to, to focus on climate change. That's uh, climate change regarding to health. Uh, all climate uh, change, all effects of climate change also impact health, one can see temperature extremes, critical episodes of rainfall, uh, droughts, uh, storms, uh, floods, landslides, fires, all those events are related to climate change and they have health effects. I'm sure you know one study, I have been studying this uh, since 95, 96 or something, but that's the last study we finished we got in the city of Sao Paulo the, the meteorological sta uh, station from the University of Sao Paulo and from the airport, Congonias Airport, a very urbanized area, because we, we wanted to get very good data. And we uh, worked with hospital admissions in an area surrounding this meteorological station. There were uh, 45,000 hospital admissions in this period, 2003, 2007, for uh, circulatory diseases and respiratory diseases for people over 60 and respiratory <coughs> disease for children up to five. And we uh, made a multiple regression analysis with uh, data on uh, daily temperature, uh, daily rainfall, daily humidity, temperature was maximum and minimum, and uh, air pollution and uh, IDH of the, that uh, zip code, that area. Uh, and I, I just put just two, two pictures to illustrate. That's the best profile area with a, a best income neighborhood around this uh, meteorological station. And that's the worst profile, but both were included in the area we studied in Sao Paulo. Well, what we found that there was a statistical, uh, statistically significant daily temperature, 
amplitude, uh, daily temperature amplitude is the difference between the minimum and the maximum temperature in a 24 hours interval uh, for children. That, that was what appeared strongly for children hospital admissions. Uh, well, I, I forgot to say it's uh, only SUS admission, so it's only for Sao Paulo, 50% of people only use SUS, uh, so it's only 50% of the population that is included in, in this study. I didn't get the private hospitals ad admissions. What came strongly is the daily uh, temperature extremes within the day uh, and air quality with temperature extremes, 1.5 or 1.3 or 1.6. But uh, when we see the distribution in the years, one, one can see that usually the, the, the graph this here is uh, admissions, children's admissions, and the lines are temperature. Okay, maximum average and minimum temperature. Usually, when temperature increase, you have a, a decrease in hospital admissions for the three years. See, those are the two meteorological stations we studied for. That's for children. And for old people, what we found that uh, circulatory disease for, uh, was higher in districts with worse environmental and social profile and also cold days with very strong temperature change associated to worsening of cardiovascular disease in both regions, uh, poor or rich. So cold was a, a risk factor and uh, uh, if not cold, the, the social environment was, has a stronger relationship. And that's the graph for old people that hospital and emissions and temperature and follows the same patterns. Usually in winter you have more hospital and emissions, so heat uh, acted as a protector factor. So uh, it, it, this is different than what uh, uh, studies uh, like in Paris, for example, that show that usually during heat waves that you have more hospital and emissions and some other things. So, uh, I, I conclude that saying that there's a, uh, uh, the studies are very complex. You have to see different variables to see. Uh, in some cases, uh, climate B is an important factor. In others, social neighborhoods are more important. Uh, the other thing that we found in another uh, study we done before is that poor housing aggravates these climate effects within the city. So this uh, cold waves and this uh, temperature amplitude during the day, like in a favela, they are much more extreme than uh, in a neighborhood like we said in the Morumbi, favela Paraisópolis in the neighborhood. So uh, poor housing aggravates. The, the elements are vi very dynamic within the city, and there are different dimensions of health. So uh, it's hard to say what is a healthy city because this concept is, can change with the change in the problems and the advancement of society and new environmental problems that come about. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as Edward mentioned, I am an epidemiologist by training um, and also am a human rights activist and work at Human Rights Watch. Um, and when I'm given a request to talk about what is a healthy city, my first challenge is to think about whether I'm going to talk about it as an epidemiologist or whether I'm going to talk about it in terms of human rights. Um, and there are times when people ask me sort of how do these two things relate to each other and, and I gave a talk at Columbia to the school to the Department of Epidemiology and I, I described my work as political epidemiology um, to which a faculty member said there's no such thing as political epidemiology <laughs> and I said that's exactly right and I'm trying to create it um, and really the way I think of my work is looking at political determinants of health and the ways in which laws and policies 
and enforcement of those laws and policies impact on health. Um, and so I did uh, a lot of the, a similar approach to Elena, which was look at WHO and look at how they were defining this idea of a healthy city. Um, and my reaction to it was like hers, to think it's not a very helpful definition. Um, and WHO, I, I work with a fair amount on different issues. And usually they frustrate me because they have a very overly technical view of things and they don't recognize the role of governance um, and you know the broader kinds of factors that influence health. Um, in this case, it was almost the opposite. I mean, it was the opposite in the sense that it wasn't a technical definition at all. Um, and talking about a healthy city as being one where people mutually support each other is not very technical. Uh, but it was identical in the sense that it was still not recognizing ideas of governance and power dynamics in any way at all. Um, and so that got me thinking about approaching this uh, talk by bringing in the issue of governance um, and bringing in the question of a healthy city as being something that requires obligation on the part of governance, that it requires civil society not just to be empowered in a general way, to, but to be able to hold accountable those that are creating a dynamic for an unhealthy city. Um, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about three small vignettes of work that I've been involved with at Human Rights Watch um, that touch on uh, unhealthy cities or urban areas that are, are threatened um, and to talk about the issues of governance, the issues of power, the issues of activism and accountability. Um, and these examples go beyond and, and uh, from Brazil to, to look at three areas where we're working in, in, um, in Bangladesh, in Russia, uh, and in Kenya. And the first in Bangladesh that I want to introduce with a, a three and a half minute or so film um, shows a researcher who works in my group um, and it, it portrays uh, the community in Dhaka of uh, Hazarabad. Um, and in each of these vignettes you'll, I think, hear some commonalities about globalization um, and about fragility of populations. And I was thinking about two things. One that's come up a number of times uh, during this conference about Rachel Carson um, and the idea of activism um, and the idea of environmental defenders, which it, you know, Brazil has been a place where there's been a lot of environmental defenders who've been threatened, who've been killed, who disappeared, um, but moving into the urban space, moving from rainforests, from agricultural lands that have been threatened to urban environments in the in the, in the space and time we're in now where uh, lower income nations are experiencing rapid both urbanization and industrialization. Um, and then the other thing um, was just this issue of um, um, hmm. well, I, I lost my thought, but I'll, I'll introduce the movie and maybe it'll come back to me. So. I'm here in Hazaribagh in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, and this has to be one of the most polluted urban environments in the world. The water that you see bubbling around me is giving off a strong, pungent odour of chemicals. The pollution comes from the neighbourhood's 150 leather tanneries. Every day, an estimated 21,000 cubic metres of untreated wastewater loaded with dangerous chemicals flows from the tannery floors to open gutters and into a stream that feeds into Dhaka's main river. I've spoken to people on both sides of this river who say that living here is, is almost unbearable. Residents, many of whom are very poor, complain of chronic health problems like fever, skin diseases, and stomach and respiratory illnesses. 
Bangladesh exported more than $660 million worth of leather in 2011, much of which ended up in Europe. But the Hazulak tanneries do not comply with local environmental regulations. <coughs> For instance, none of the tanneries have waste treatment plants, even though they're mandated by Bangladeshi law. I've spoken to officials in the Ministry of Environment who say they do not monitor what's in this water, in the air, or in the soil in Hazuri Bank. I was working 15 years, my production job, but when I was getting sick, worse, then I went to doctor, and doctor advised me, Victor, you should not come and contact with chemical anymore, so leave this job. <laughs> You know, most of the workers don't use personal protective equipment in this uh, industries. Um, so most of them are exposed to chemicals. You know, the chromium is one of the important chemicals used here for training. And this chromium is very toxic. Children as young as 11 also work in some tanneries without gloves, boots or masks. They work long hours for as little as 50 cents a day. Many of the workers do not receive proper equipment and training and they don't receive sick leave or compensation if they're injured on the job. <laughs> Janella still works at the tannery. She didn't receive compensation for her injury, but she fears that if she speaks out against her employer, she'll lose her job. Bangladesh has laws that could protect workers and the environment. But as long as the government allows the hazard of tanneries to operate outside these laws, the local people and tannery workers will continue paying with their health. Okay, uh, so I, I mean, I think from these images, there isn't much question that this is not a healthy city. Um, there's an element here where there's gross violations in terms of labor law, involving ch children labor is involving protection from hazardous working conditions and chemicals. Um, what I think is interesting is, is how the, I mean, tanneries historically have occurred in a lot of different countries, including the U.S. Um, dye manufacturing has occurred in New Jersey and caused an enormous um, uh, health problem in, in the community of Tom's River, not too far from here. Uh, with a cluster of childhood leukemias and cancers. Um, and it's this combination of factors involving industry, involving health, involving the failure of the state to intervene and to protect people's health. Um, and what I want to bring out in the next two stories is something that's not strong here in, in Hazarabag, but that's the idea of activists pushing back. And one of the challenges in Hazarabag was um, People were not very secure in their jobs. They weren't very secure in the communities. Um, and we actually interviewed people who said that they were hoping to get a better job. And we asked them what the better job they thought they might be able to get was. And they said in the um, uh, textile um, factories. Not long thereafter, you may remember the Bangladesh textile factories collapsed, causing hundreds of uh, deaths. Um, so there's a real uh, fragility there in terms of even being able to identify a possibility for a healthy community. So the next example is from Kenya. Um, and we've been working with a woman by the name of Phyllis Amido. Um, and for the past four years, she's been uh, a community activist working to organize and educate the community uh, outside of uh, Mombasa on a lead smelter. And the lead smelter is situated on the edge of a slum of about 3,000 people. Um, it was started without proper uh, licensing or permits or consultation with the community. Um, the 
her Phyllis's involvement started when she was working in the smelter um, and her child got very sick with lead poisoning um, and she went to the hospital and the hospital provided treatment um, and she asked the doctors how did this happen to my child um, and the doctor said well you're working in a lead smelter there's a lead smelter near the community of course you're going to have a health impact from that and she said lead causes health problems there was no education at all um, and she went to the company the factory um, and they gave her some money for the treatment of her child and made her sign a non disclosure agreement but pretty quickly she started violating that non disclosure agreement because other workers started getting sick other workers children started getting sick other people in the community started getting sick and they knew that she had had a problem and so they went to her and started asking her questions and she started taking on the role of educating people and when she started doing that she also started getting death threats and her house was broken into and she was arrested for inciting violence and so we've been working with her to raise attention to the proper regulation and licensing of the smelter um, but to also protect her and help her defend her case um, in, at, in the courts. Um, if she's convicted, she could go to prison for five years. Her case is still ongoing. Um, we've worked with the UN's uh, Special Rapporteur on the Right to a Healthy Environment to bring him to, to see her case and to champion her case um, and to fight back against the intimidation she's received. Um, so a third case I want to highlight is of a Russian uh, environmental activist by the name of Yevgeny Vitashenko. Um, and he was arrested and imprisoned on the eve of the Olympics in Sochi. He had been an activist about the environmental destruction around the construction of the Olympics in Sochi. Um, he was initially picked up and accused of spray painting a fence of a home under construction, outside of a, a home under construction. And it was a home belonging to the governor of the state, and it was being built in a national park. Um, and so there was a heightened political attention to the fact that this was being done um, improperly. So he was given a suspended sentence at first. There was a lot of attention to his case. Um, and then just before the Olympics, he was picked up and accused of swearing at a bus stop. Um, and this violated his suspended sentence, and he got three years in a penal colony as a sentence. So, you know, we have these cases where the ability for the community to push back, to question, to demand accountability, to demand... Um, responsiveness, participation in environmental planning, environmental impact, um, to demand just basic health information about the consequences of industrialization um, are threatened. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think is an interesting phenomenon that's come out a bit, and, and Joao started the discussion about this a little bit in his opening <coughs> remarks, um, was the idea of transition from national to urban city level attention. And in the human rights sphere, a lot of human rights attention is at the national level because it's national governments that sign treaties um, and holding urban, holding city government officials responsible for fundamental rights is a more difficult proposition. There's less attention, there's less ability to get attention to abuses that are happening at a local level versus at a, at a wider uh, national level. Um, but there's also, I think, greater power with social networking, with media attention, to raise these cases to, to broader uh, global attention. Um, and so there's a tension there. Um, and you know, I want to underscore that this is um, really an increasing phenomenon that we're seeing, both attacks on civil society, but also the consequences of urbanization and industrialization being very acutely felt by specific populations. And sometimes those populations are, you know, local populations, sometimes they're um, 
racial or ethnic minorities that have a fragile hold on the land. Uh, with climate change and the, and the onset of, of climate refugees, there's even a greater precariousness in some of these places. Um, so I talked at, at, the, at the opening about zones of abandonment. Um, and you look at these vibrant slums and these vibrant communities like Hazarabagh, um, and there's nothing that sort of feels like abandonment in terms of the health threats that they're facing. Um, but there's a fundamental abandonment in terms of the government's role and obligation to ensure and respect people's health. So I'll end there and look forward to the commentaries and, and the responses. Thank you. Security, the doors are locked. We won't, we won't leave until we've done justice to the papers, the last two papers and all the papers. So. <laughs> At least until the wee hours of the morning, let's, let's stick around. And we have three yeah. doctors here, so we're all good. <laughs> we have enough water, <laughs> enough ideas to last us for, for, for days on end. The, the, the ghost of Einstein hovers around Princeton. He used to say that uh, the the genius is somebody who hides his source as well. I don't, uh, my ambitions are of course not Einstein's or the geniusness. The reason I say that is because in this case my source is sitting there. Arcadio, I have heard start uh, talks by saying that he's, he's come ready to improvise, like, mm -hmm. like the jazz man. Um, in this case, it's as if, well, it's harder to, to, to I suppose the analogy, the jazz analogy for a discussant would be a bass player. And it's as if there would have been so many solos of uh, saxophones, uh, beating bows, all different types of instruments. So it's, it's not an, an, an easy job to somehow try to, to, to uh, uh, make these, these really wonderful uh, 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 papers talk to everything else we, we talk about. And in many ways, I'll, I'll really try to turn this question back at you. Uh, what is a healthy city? What is an unhealthy city? I think in, 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 um, um, in many ways we've, we've tried to do the, the opposite of what our cities have tried, or tried to do in modernity in the 20th century. And what, as I spoke about briefly last morning, medical practices tried to do, specialization of function, separation. I mean, here we, we've really brought together, uh, it, it was somewhat of a risky proposition to, to bring together people who work with different materials, different approaches, different epistemological traditions, different concerns. And uh, uh, there's a way in which it's very hard to, 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 to quantify and get a sense of what comes out of a, of a, of a conversation, the, out of the conversations that we've been having for the last two days. And there's a way in which th there's a, 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 a tradition now of, of Speaking of the, the, um, uh, imagine, the imagination of infrastructure in urban studies, and uh, it, there's a sense in which uh, what we've been doing here is, is trying to stretch uh, 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 the infrastructure of imagination, right? uh, uh, of how we imagine issues of health, of urbanity, and of, of the environment as, as a way through which to do well justice to the scale of the impending environmental urban health crises that uh, seems to, to be uh, latent in, in a lot of the talks, and if I may say a lot of the talks by, by, by particularly the, the younger scholars that we have this concern with the future, more uh, present. So maybe that's part of what, what we can um, uh, talk about. Uh, one of the, the, the wonderful thing about uh, 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 geographers and about Elena's talk is the concern with um, scale. <coughs> scales as well of, of imagination and, and scales of, of um, action uh, in the human rights case, uh, scale of, of, of cities. And uh, there's something outdated about a question like what is a healthy city? Because what in a world like ours is not a city, right? Or what's immune to urbanity uh, conceived broadly, suburbanity, uh, Etc. And, 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 and both of these talks touched on that. I think John mentioned the first day the question of um, boundedness. And physicians, uh, uh, those that work with, with health and with human bodies, more than those of us that work with cities, 
uh, have an easy answer to that. Lili mentioned the limits of the body when we die. What are the limits of a city? Right? Where does a city end? Uh, Emila showed us that, uh, uh, you know, even, even in rural Brazilian areas, you're, 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 you're part of, 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 of meat and visual culture <coughs> that are produced out of capitals. Agricultural production is connected through capital to cities. Right? So uh, it's become very difficult to, 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 to uh, uh, define these, these boundaries between cities um, and the environment and, and to try to make sense of how they, they work with each other. And how, in fact, as we're now uh, learning to imagine, cities can be part of the solution for a healthier environment, right? Cities, not just as hubs of innovation, but in energy terms, they can be a lot more efficient than, say, uh, Sprawl. But it's hard to, 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 to plan, to, to, to think of infrastructure beyond electoral cycles, right? We're somehow trapped in that, and our politicians don't want to invest. Say, there's a saying in, in, in the interior of Brazil among vereadores, city councillors, that uh, sanitation doesn't translate into votes, right? So there's sort of all type of built-in incentives uh, uh, for, for politicians to invest in something like electricity where you're plugged into the consumer market, but not sanitation, which has much more long-term and much more vital uh, uh, um, consequences to the health, to our health, right? Health does that, going back to the question of boundedness, the, the, uh, one of the, ro the root of health is whole, right? Uh, so that uh, bird's eye scale. As, as we mentioned earlier, the root in, of saúde is, is save salvation. And I think one of the questions is how do we save ourselves from ourselves, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Carolyn, Carolyn Rouse asked what are the, the limits of development? That's a question that we can turn in, um, well, many directions. Um, there is, there's a lot here. We didn't actually lock the doors. Hope no one called 911. With that, I'll turn to João and then turn great. to you guys. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you all. So, uh, just a few, a few thoughts, and it will be freely associative. This is an incredibly rich, and I think it's almost like, you know, we are filled with new ideas, languages, and uh, and hopefully they will, they will, you know, stay with us as we proceed back to our places where where, where we come from and the kinds of works we do and we might do them, you know, with a bit more insight, maybe find a swerve or find a new project in which those things might, might materialize. So uh, when, uh, when Nicolau was, was speaking this morning and preparing somehow the discussion that we are having now, you know, I was just, I was just uh, this, this incredibly powerful image of this complex system, right, in that we now inhabit for better or for worse. And how do we make sense, sense of those? And I think we are discussing this a little bit in this in the graduate seminar that we are having this semester, you know, and the anthropology of becoming, we call it, you know. So, so if we think of ourselves as part of more than one system, just part of a country or part of a uh, or, or, or of a city or part of one marker, you know, of a population or ethnic group, you know, or, or or of gender, you know, if you think of ourselves as part of biological systems or infrastructures, you know, histories, you know, multiple systems, biological systems technical systems, you know. So what does that say, or what does that do to the ways we think about, you know, power and agency, structure and agency, right? And, and I think some of those questions, they popped up here as, as well in a very practical manner, right? right. So, so how do we actually intervene in the city, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, who is the activist now, or like, you know? And, and, and I think this question, when we, when, um, of, the, of belonging to these complex systems and then and a, and a set, an awareness of that, I think allows us, at least as social scientists, to break open like this binaries, you know, structure, agency. And I think it teaches us this humility, you know, so, so of how do we attend to the agency of things that we are in relationship with, but at the same time not giving up the human you know, uh, aspect of, of our existence and our obligation, you know, towards, you know, towards families, towards houses, you know, to, to, towards each other, which is the question of, 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 uh, uh, of human rights, and that has to be mediated by concrete institutions. So I think this question of uh, our concept, you know, of the, of, of the subject, I think, was kind of opened up in a very creative way throughout this, 
this conference. And I think then the question of power, you know, how do we access power? How do we intervene politically? You know, where, where is power? You know, how do we intervene? And I think that's a, that's a critical question. I think what Joe asked about, can we identify who are the grassroots, you know, environmental activists? You know, not just the ones who meet to create this, uh, this statement, right, of quite empty, but who are the ones who on the ground are struggling for local communities, for the betterment of a house, you know, for, you know, for, for a toilet or a sewage system. You know, how can we become more aware of how people are responding themselves you know, to urbanization, to you know, changes in, in climate? And, uh, and, uh, and I think this, this raised this complicated question to all of us. I think we, we, uh, who are our subjects? You know, how, you know, what are the people who are inhabiting the city? And I, and I think they're very complicated, ambiguous people. They're consumers, they're citizens, you know. You know, they are, you know, they're, they're people who belong to households, who want to go back to households. As we saw with Dr. Varela yesterday, people who, you know, want to die at home, you know. People who have uh, not even the right to die, you know, right. at home. And I, think I, and I think, again, the question of power, the question of the subject, how do we intervene? You know, who are the activists? How can we pluralize those who speak? Who are the experts? You know, we, we, we saw very clearly from Elena and from Joe's uh, explanation that the experts you know, are quite empty and the big words they have, right? But I think if we scale back, and I think the city allows us to get more concrete about the subject, about power, you know, and about even like wonderful, important the theoretical debates, you know, about matters and uh, infrastructures, but these become very, in, in the end, they're still peopled. You know, they're, they're still, it's still uh, lives are still uh, at stake. So my last point is that, uh, I, I love that Bruno said, maybe that's not the right question, maybe already beyond the question, what's a healthy city? And I, and I think it's a wonderful place, you know, to, to get at, you know, where the question becomes uh, somehow uh, irrelevant. It was just a, a crutch that we had, like a, a plateau that we reached, and I think we, the kind of conversations we had, you know, hopefully will allow us to ask other, other questions. Yeah, so to you guys. Okay, we'll take a group of questions. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you, Elena and Joseph, for this uh, presentation, and Bruno and Joao. Uh, I want to make some comments, uh, actually, about Joseph's uh, talk. And actually, your talk. Uh, touched me. Why? Because I'm an epidemiologist. Mm. And I'm a, a, a teach epidemiology for medical students in the University of Sao Paulo, in the Presidential Medicine Department. And you started your talk saying, I don't know if I would talk as an epidemiologist or as someone from the human rights field. And I, and I ask you, why to split apart? And I say that because I am an epidemiologist that actually work in a research center in Sao Paulo that is a human rights research center. I don't know if you know Paulo Sergio Pinheiro and Paulo Mesquita. Mm -hmm. Paulo yeah. Mesquita yeah. and my colleagues you know, also at Navi. And so that's why you, you have to touch on me. I say, why you started splitting apart? And why it's not possible to make this fusion between epidemiology and the human rights? promotion and fights for the different rights and belonging. And then you talk about this idea of constructing political epidemiology. So please tell me what is this? <laughs> I'm interested in the issue. And I'd like to hear more. And that's why I'm actually, and then when Joan was making his comments and asking which are these characters in the city and these people and the workers, and the, we are one of those characters. I am a professor at the University of Sao Paulo, an epidemiologist. I work in a research center that deals with human rights, but I am a citizen of Sao Paulo. We are part of the city, so how, what's our role as academics to actually politically not, uh, politically construct this healthy year where we can change this environment? So, that's, I was very touched by yeah, yeah. your talk. Maybe you can talk more later. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have a reflection based on what I heard, which is really fantastic, and based on the comments as well. Um, I, I kind of agree. Maybe the question, what is a health city, is outdated. Um, we talked a lot about islands of poverty, and maybe we have islands of success, and we 
keep talking about things that go wrong. There's another geographer, Jared Dive, who has an entire book about how societies and cities collapse. So why don't we start talking about things that are actually right? And accept the fact that not all of those things can be scaled up or can be replicated. But maybe we can learn from some of them. Maybe we can be political epidemiologists and see the policies and the lack of policies and how they impact on, on health. And maybe that's a better question. It's focus on the islands, and here comes again the issue of scale, and learn from those islands, knowing that you're never going to have, and maybe I shouldn't say that, but you're never going to have an entire city that's healthy. Uh, it's a, perhaps more common to rather than question, but uh, and it may be that uh, it may be a good idea for perhaps the next round in, in Raqqa and the race and citizenship. Are you beginning to plan next year? Yeah, <laughs> let's start from, from this, this moment. Uh, because if, if I'm not wrong, I mean, some of the perhaps highest moments in our discussion with various wonderful panels um, came out of this uh, feeling that uh, there is, to quote uh, Nicolaus' talk this morning, uh, order out of chaos, uh, which, which is something that uh, has to do, of course, with uh, something dear to all of us, which, is, which are these moments of crystallization, these moments when you have a sort of an order, a, a, a work that uh, seems to be forbidden. I think we, we try to avoid it because it's so tear it, etc. But there is a moment in which order sort of uh, gains a certain uh, power because exactly of its transit transitory and temporary uh, uh, nature. And, and I think we are sort of uh, trying to, to look for that moment and trying to uh, probably locate that very moment in which uh, crystallization is in the making, which is a problem that makes me think that perhaps our next step uh, goes either uh, in the direction of uh, studying poetry and literature, which might be, I mean, which is all about that, or going to back to religion, because this very moment is the sacred moment. I mean, the the, the idea of belonging has to do with this very feeble, this very subtle and necessarily tr transitory moment in which something makes sense. Uh, so I, I would go either in that direction of poetry and literature or religion, I mean, for perhaps our next step. It's just an idea. Should we try to answer those or should we go? No, it's correct. No, I think it's rich, rich, rich. Rich. Yes. Oh, John. Eddie, John. Yeah. John. Yeah. Um, Joseph, towards the very end, I was on sitting at the edge of my seat because I saw the problem, and then you use this very rich, ultimately it's a, it's a metaphorical term, which is vibrancy. Mm -hmm. And I think that something's vibrating and radioactive that we need to recognize. In a way, this is sort of playing off of a couple of the, of the comments here. But in order to know it's vibrant, I need to know how to distinguish this from something else. I'm, I'm a real fan of models, but I'm feeling that vibrancy may be the opposite of vibrancy is model, and that we need to have, in effect, the ability to recognize vibrancy and not models. Um, models are very academically attractive. We want them. We want to have that clarity, the boundedness. But that may be part of the problem. And was, this is a little bit of what I was, I don't claim to have fully understood um, the, the wonderful <coughs> long lecture today, but I, it seemed to me that it was, in a way, uh, sort of asking us to question models and NGOs and the human rights, you know, activism process and, and states, you know, require models institutionally for career, for reporting and so on, but maybe vibrancy is where we need to go. over 60, what contributed to that um, cognitive capacity in older ages. There's actually evidence from um, 
countries, for example, like China, where you run a multivariable regression, and then you see that the community income levels where that person grew up are actually associated with the levels of cognitive <coughs> skills later in life after age 60. Um, but interestingly enough, for women and not for men. And then uh, my group uh, that I'm working with at Hopkins right now, we try to replicate these uh, findings in Latin America. We saw that it's actually the same uh, relationship that we see, not, not, the com not the level of income that you see in your household, but the level of income that you see in your community. Now, we don't really know what that means. And, and that's my question to you guys, that does it mean that it's the community resources that I can access as a child that maybe are going to impact my life later on? Or maybe it's the behavior of this community, or which, which other kinds of factors could we think of that, that can have a reflection so much later on? Great. Um, so th there are a number of things here that I want to pull together. Um, I mean, I very much don't see myself as schizophrenic. I see epidemiology and human rights um, as being linked. And, um, and in my class here at Princeton that I teach epidemiology, um, I, I try and infuse an idea of epidemiology as a science that is linked to action. Um, and it's contested. There's a conservatism within epidemiology of, uh, and of uh, policy making uh, organizations like the Centers for Disease Control that uh, want to delink that a bit. Um, <clears throat> but I very much see them together. And, um, and I think that um, also kind of gets to another area that I'm interested in, which is this issue of models and vibrancy and, um, and brings in Mariana's point too, which is kind of what are you measuring? And is it a proxy for something that is hard to measure? And how do you address that inability to measure uh, complexity and the inability to measure perhaps um, the, the elements that you need to be measuring? Um, and that's where, um, you know, I think that, that some of my work in terms of trying to kind of foster an, uh, a field of political epidemiology is about looking for innovative ways to measure um, these effects and placing uh, power and state action uh, in a way in which epidemiology often takes it out because they're using measures that, for example, are race rather than measures that are explicit discrimination <coughs> or experiences um, and in a way that kind of dilutes the understanding of power uh, and relationship uh, to the state being, being an actor and then creates a dynamic where the answer um, to, the, to, to putting in place an intervention is not challenging the state, but it's about not being that race because that's the only variable that you have is it's worse if you're black. Well, if that's the proxy for something else that you should have been measuring, you've lost the ability to determine exactly how you could intervene effectively. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, I was a little bit tongue in cheek also about the response at, at, um, at Columbia because their um, response was a little bit more like, well, there's social epidemiology, which is supposed to be um, including and encompassing the, the issues of political determinants. Um, and my pushback was, but it doesn't. It leaves aside these variables um, and does a bad job of, of going beyond just questions of, of inequity, but to the actors that are creating the inequity and bringing that out in the analysis. Um, I'll um, maybe put in a quick uh, advertisement. I'm teaching a course at Columbia. It's a one-week short course on political determinants of health. Um, and, uh, one of the, th the funny things about it was I initially had submitted the course under the title of Political Epidemiology, and the course uh, organizer for the epidemiology sort of institute there said, um, no, that's not a good title. Because <laughs> 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 people will think it's political. 
Um, and uh, so there, you know, there is this tension of trying to figure out, you know, how to frame this and to connect it to what I think has a lot of power, the epidemiologic methods and techniques and approaches and philosophies and models, um, but to make it link to uh, what I think also has a lot of power, which is accountability and state obligations and specific actions, because if you can identify those, you can press for changes, and, and, um, and I'll leave it at that. So. Well, I'll just make some comments. I think it's, it's important the, what you, Bruno said, that cities can be part of the solution, solutions. Uh, I, I have a more optimistic view on that, and I think really uh, cities have achieved a lot in terms of health and in terms of environment, uh, even in Sao Paulo, pollution control was for very effective. Nowadays we have uh, a better air quality than we had 20 <coughs> years ago, but the, the problems are, every day you have new problems, so it's nothing uh, that we can relax and stay, well, we, have, we are in a healthy city because uh, one problem with this, what you said, us, the city has no boundaries, is as soon as a city or, or neighborhood gets better, a lot of people come in and to live there. If the school system is good, people migrate from the other municipalities to put their children in the school in that municipality, or if the, the neighborhood <coughs> has a good appearance or is beautified or something, then you have people living that so uh, the problems are uh, constant and the, uh, this idea of no boundaries of cities or municipalities also uh, you have to, uh, to, to have an integration between uh, other municipalities and between different levels of government because if not uh, all the policies fail like even if you treat 100% of our sewage. We see this situation a lot in the state. Then the river gets out clean of our municipality. In the next municipality, 100% is not treated. So it gets dirty again. So it gets to the other municipality uh, dirty. So you, you have to have an agreement. Uh, and all the municipalities would have to, to treat sewage. And the same with uh, garbage collection and uh, air pollution and climate change, of course, that's more democratic even because uh, for the laws of physics, the air, mm -hmm. and the air moves from one place to the other. So uh, there's one, not one simple solution at the local level. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the, the mayor or the secretary of environment or the secretary of health is responsible for that municipal <coughs> limit only and, and sometimes doesn't have the resources because the resources are uh, in federal government and so uh, it has to be an integrated action. Uh, and Marcia, I think it, you are right, you, you can uh, look at this mirror of islands of success and maybe learn with uh, good practices and see what was successful in some ways and but in other countries and other states and other municipalities. Uh, and regarding community resource that Mariana <coughs> mentioned, there's a lot of literature nowadays on social capital and social capital and health also. So I think that's uh, a way you could uh, work on it because uh, it's not only the family and the, the resource of that family that the, usually the, the person uses and if you have a good school, if you have good friends and things that maybe will help that person in their life in a health uh, situation also. Let me add one comment and that gets to, I think, something I didn't bring out really in my talk, um, which is that 
I think there is not just the sort of environmental activist versus the state dynamic, but there is the powerful voices for positive change you know, within the state. Um, and oftentimes when we're working on an issue at Human Rights Watch, the Ministry of Health is absolutely in agreement because they're, we're both talking about evidence-based solutions that protect health. Uh, but there's other parts of the state that are more powerful than the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. And so part of what the role of activism is to, to push the problem up to a level where it can be mediated um, and decided in the favor of the weaker ministry, which is the Ministry of Health, versus the police or you know, economic development or other factors of the government that have other interests than the health of the population. So that gives it a little bit more complexity, too, in terms of how it plays out. And also, let me just say that I could hear the jazz coming out in the <laughs> two commentaries, and I like that analogy to looking at this issue. Did you get the no, I want to hear, do you have a, you can collect one. Arkad, do you have anything to? Yes. Yes, you, you are the man. Well, um, first of all, thank you very much and, and uh, to all of you and the organizers of this uh, wonderful symposium. Of course, many questions. Uh, I'll focus on the question of activism. Uh, I wish I would have the choice of being a political, uh, uh, to, to teach that political thing. We do it in such a great ways. <laughs> but I was uh, uh, very, um, I think, uh, uh, touched too throughout the discussion and the three days uh, by something that is quite important for me. That most of the papers uh, were telling stories mm -hmm. uh, and uh, important stories, uh, either. Uh, Narrate, narrating in the paper with images that we have Dr. Varela yesterday two very powerful images uh, and uh, the question of, uh, of the story, who tells the story is a very delicate question and uh, an ethical problem too and I admire the way uh, the ethnography presented here was uh, done with such uh, tact and, and respect I think that's a lesson for, for those of us who are not, unfortunately, ethnographers. And I think that's a real political problem as well. As, as citizens, uh, uh, in also in the academic sphere, how, what is our role in telling those stories? How uh, should those stories be told to whom? And what are the, what are the limits? Carolyn Rose, I think, in her comments raised the question of uh, a very important question of uh, the space of the profession, and that's a question that many of us are asking ourselves. You know, what is really the space of the profession? Uh, and Joao, in his work, raised the question of uh, citizenship very strongly and democracy. Uh, so my question has to do. With, I would like to hear you talking more, perhaps, about. Uh, narrating these stories, uh, Joseph, through the, um, through the brief documentary uh, with the activist and these very sad stories. Uh, who gets to tell the story and to whom? And the problems raised, the political problems raised uh, in that process uh, of uh, becoming a, a sort of voice for others. Yeah. Which is a problem that we have seen here a lot today. What, what is left out? And what does citizenship mean in, in that case? Yeah. Uh, I would like to maybe have you uh, comments on that. Today. Yeah. I mean, I think it's an incredibly important question and an incredibly difficult question, um, and one that I think about a lot. Um, I, at first, I thought you were proposing the next conference because there's a lot there that we could really talk about. Um, you know, one of the 
one of the challenges that we face when we talk to people, whether we're capturing their stories in writing or whether we're capturing it um, in video, is explaining to them how we're going to use their stories. Um, and sometimes this can be straightforward. Um, people know the organization, they've seen our work in the press, um, and sometimes it's not at all straightforward. They've never heard of the organization before. They don't know the media and the mass media reach that we have, um, or they have specific barriers. I've, I led our work on uh, disability rights for several years, um, and interviewing people with mental disabilities um, and talking to them about how we're going to use uh, their recounting of their experiences in an environment that's going to get a lot of attention is, is something that's um, challenging. Uh, to ensure true consent, understanding of the process, um, maintaining privacy, um, or, and there's a trade-off. Uh, some people want privacy, some people don't want privacy. They want their name attached to their story, they want their story out there. Um, there are times when we think that even if they want their story out there, we don't think it's safe for their story to be out there. And so then it becomes a challenge of whether we respect their wishes to not have confidentiality or whether we feel like we're um, not willing to sort of play that role of promoting their story when it's it, it's unsafe. Um, you know, the 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 answer is is also one where there's often just very shifting terrain in terms of security, um, and so. Um, you know, one of the things that we try and do is make sure uh, we're really in touch with the people that we've been speaking with so that there isn't any kind of uh, backlash or recrimination. I mean, they, um, they don't get editorial control over a film like this, um, so we don't give them the kind of power to shape the clip that we use. Um, and that also creates a tension where um, what we judge to be powerful for the audience that we're trying to present uh, the information to um, may not be what they think is the highest priority and the most pressing thing in their lives. There was a very um, incredible book published this year um, by a Chinese poet who was jailed after Tianmen. Um, and he talks about the incredible um, <clears throat> boredom of being in jail and the deprivation and the inability to have access to a pen and a piece of paper to be able to continue to write poems. Um, he also talks in the book about being brutally beaten and uh, subject to electric shocks with a taser. Um, Human Rights Watch would have a hard time taking the concept of boredom and promoting it, whether in a film or in a report. But he was presenting the physical torture as a relief from the boredom and something he almost sought out as a way to have a real personal ownership of his daily existence. Was if he was the actor in instigating the backlash that led to the beating, then he had some control. And taking that complex dynamic um, into a piece that we would do for advocacy purposes would be just really challenging. Um, and so, you know, we do shape narratives um, and we do select uh, people to interview and to, to promote stories. Um, but we also may try and make sure we have a real understanding and a consent process of, of the fact that we're using those stories and those voices in that way. And we're very clear to, to people also that we're not um, promising individual benefits and we're not seeking to represent, in most cases, their particular case. We're seeking for a, a more global improvement that may take a long time and that may take lots of steps. Um, so managing those expectations is also a part of the, the process of 
uh, negotiating the use of testimony and, and voice. Thank you. I, I think maybe that's a good moment because when we are approaching the end, you know, just this, this uh, how how the subjects inhabit, you know, multiple regimes of representation, right? Multiple temporalities too. All of a sudden, you ended them being, you know, global subjects of yeah, sorts right. with the question of how their condition could be politicized. And at the same time, never forgetting the incredible, the concretude of their wounds, mm -hmm. right? Or the, still the fun they had, the playfulness they had, right? And uh, the impossibility they had to lay claims on the state or because of you know, right. the, the, uh, the risk of, of losing their job. So, so I think, and that was so beautiful, I think, today, in the, again, going back to, 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 to what Nicolau brought us into, you know, like how we inhabit these multiple systems you know, of ideas, concepts that get materialized, wars that get transmogrified in, in architectures, in, in, um, in products that we consume, you know, that we think will enhance health of the collective but might poison you know, uh, the household and, and, and so on. But in the end, too, in creativity, right? In uh, Artur Vispudo Rosario, right? And that, that creativity, you know, the, 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 the garbage recycling in the city, and then the caring professional who develops a different way of engaging with that human condition. That was not a pre-given, you know? It, it's, it's of the moment, too. It's of today. It's not just the subject of history. It's emerging vis-a-vis -vis all these temporalities, these demands, and you know, and things and technologies and poisons. And I think that kind of openness, I think that you brought us analytically with, but in a very concrete way, from the idea, from the war, you know, the, the, the war machine. And then again, but people are remaking their existences. There's a vibrancy, something is unleashed, right? And I think, I think those are, are good points for us, you know, to, uh, to, you know, to pause when we think about city, you know, we are also thinking, as Dr. Vela said, you know, my city, you know. So there's something of the subject in the city there. And, uh, and, uh, and that always allows for a different, you know, problematization of the present and maybe uh, a questioning of which kind of politics and how would politics matter uh, in this specific time and space. Yeah, no, very briefly, just uh, to Aproveitar o embalo. E no embalo. É. O embalo do gaúcho, não acredito, carioca. Well, Dr. Drauzio's uh, talk ended with, with the streets of his childhood, and those were the streets that Le Corbusier declared to be obsolete, right? Streets were for cars, they were to move around capital, they were not for us, not for people. And I mean, Le Corbusier was, of course, uh, wrong. Uh, João mentioned ethnography as, a, as a, an er early warning system, or as having that potential. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, so are streets, and whatever is happening to so many of our, of our streets in Brazil, in Ukraine, in New York City, mm -hmm. visible or invisible, they are symptoms of um, uh, broader uh, things. And uh, you know, there's a way, I think Massa makes, makes an important point, particularly to all those of us in the humanities who are sort of, you know, the historians of science have this, this, this critique of Whiggishness, thinking of Whigs and Tories, sort of historiography that necessarily sees uh, uh, the past as inevitably a part of a present that's a progression towards a more liberal democracy. There's a way in which in critical theory we're treated to be Toryish, right? It's always everything's leading to something, to a dead end of sorts. So I love this idea of thinking in terms of, of solutions and of what's possible. But in terms of cities, we have become actually very good at identifying what works at the micro level. And even at identifying the orders that are concealed within what looks at first sight like disorders. But I think there's something else that is very important uh, and that I, th I think was latent in a lot of the talks, which is the extent to which, uh, on the one hand, we've, and again, I'm talking about planning. I don't know how this applies to, to all the other fields. We've, we've assimilated the, 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 the failures of Le Corbusier flying over a city like Rio and figuring it all out, right? We now know to be more humble, more contingent, more modest in our aims on the one hand. On the other hand, we have, uh, it seems, irrevocably altered the alkalinity of our oceans. On the other hand, 
you know, we're dealing with more than, 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 than sidewalks. And we need to, to quote Nicolau, somehow stretch our epistemological horizons, right? And this, this is an exercise towards that, hopefully. I, why don't we end that on, <laughs> on, on, on stretching our horizons? What about that, Bruno? That's great. Thank you. Thank you.